If you can't fly, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. And if you can't crawl, then whatever you do, just keep moving forward. And this was a great quote by Martin Luther King. And today is Martin Luther King Day. And uh, it's talked about the world of action and the, uh, and the idea that you have to stay in motion. And when it comes to investing, when you're speculating and trying to be early, the whole concept is first mover advantage. So how do you get first mover advantage? What must you do? And our world has changed rapidly with the quant approach. Quants can read a whole 10K in one minute. One minute. They can read 250 pages, the white paper by the feds, and immediately markets are going up or down. The Federal Reserve, the chair of the Federal Reserve recently called uh, some hedge funds and made a re changed the press release because the market was rising because two words were in the white paper that were not in the previous white paper and within that minute the market started moving up and they clarified that it was an error and the market sold down. It is a new world. And sentiment, sentiment factors and word choice is very important that in press releases it was analyzed a long time ago by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Barry Cooper, that if a market has these, if a press release has these seven words in the headline, the stock will fall 12 to 27 percent over two weeks. It now happens in two hours. Two hours. Before an analyst could turn around and digest the information and look at it. So I became so interested in this quant approach and I started using it and, and, and I launched an ETF around it. And I want to try to explain to you. It's the, the, the sort of the concept of using physics and chemistry and biology. So what are the quant forces? They're using gravity or they're looking at inertia. And when you look at gravity, it's called mean reversion. And like I said earlier on the panel today, over the past 20 years, the standard deviation that is 70% of the time, gold goes up or down 20% over a rolling 12 month period. That's his DNA of volatility. The S&P is exactly the same. But the talking heads on the CNBC will tell you that gold's more volatile. It is not. So the idea and the concept is when something moves up one or two standard deviations, you should take profits. And when it falls one or two standard deviations, you should just start to accumulate. That is applying physics, the law of gravity. And the other one is inertia, momentum, and growth. So if you have growth where the revenue the last quarter is above four quarters, that's the top line, and the revenue on a per share basis, uh, the cash flow for the last quarter is above the four quarter average. Now you have inertia, and it basically says the stock with momentum will continue until one of those two things break down. <clears throat> so it tries to give you an idea to appreciate the concept, and everyone knows my friend Sherlock Holmes, a distant relative in another reality, but a different, but the point is, is that he was a deductive thinker. And then Dr. House, he was an inductive thinker. And what has happened in the quant world is it was difficult to create induction. And how would you, until we all of a sudden could do data mining on the cloud and it became cheaper. And all of a sudden you could have algorithms that looked at artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that was a game changer. And it became cheaper and cheaper. And the chips they use for virtual reality, for any type of mining of Ethereum, if you're in the crypto space, are what are called GPU chips. NVIDIA, they make these GPU chips and they have many applications. And if you're in the mining business and you're creating three-dimensional graphics, you need to have GPU chips. So what is this machine learning? It is looking for patterns pattern recognition, such as if these seven words show up in a headline, that information has what's called a gamma that is relevant for three days, maybe three hours, but it has some relevance. And then they take a look at databases, and they're always so curious in the quant world of looking at databases. And what I found in my experience is that you have to clean data. And I spent, when we're building GoAU, the ETF, I spent 8,000 hours, and you won't believe this, I took 100 factors, and I found out that half the factors are good for stock screening, but not for stock picking. And the ones that were good for stock picking, I turned around and had a test, and it takes you eight hours to go through one test of one factor. And then you start trying to find out where the best factors are. In that whole process, now I discovered, I finally have the five best 
factors. And I go out and I use Bloomberg data and I use Foxec data and I get a different outcome. How could that be from the same stock prices? Well, spin outs, mergers, name changes, one data, one data collector gets it correct, the other one doesn't. So you have to go back and scrub the data. It's so important. And every quarter we have to scrub the data. Every quarter there's a stock that populates that should not be in that basket of names. And so this is the, even though you have this quant approach, it's not a black box because you have to always be scrubbing data. So machine learning is not an expl explicit programming process like Excel. It's about a probability that if A and B plus C, it means a probability that the D outcome will be this. And this happened statistically 80% of the time. So for the past 20 years, gold on, on a yearly basis, a calendar basis, has been up 80% of the time. It's been down 20% of the time. So it becomes statistically meaningful. So what does it relate to that's driving that? What macro factor is helping propel that? And what we saw was the basket of sovereign debt around the world that is offering negative real interest rates. So as the percentage of government bonds were offering negative rates was growing and growing and growing, so was the gold price. And when gold hit 1900, the US 10-year government bond had a minus 3% negative real rate of return. And then it went to plus 2% while gold fell from 1900 to 1000. And then as rates started going negative again, gold has been rallying. So you look for those patterns. And then sentiment analysis, coming back to that, words. Word choice is so important because everyone uses Google and Google is based on what's called NLP, Natural Language, language Processing. And the quant funds have put it on steroids. Their ability to process so quickly in the blink of an eye. So what they look for are sentiments and market trends. And they basically calibrate if the information is positive or negative, And then they calibrate how long is it good for. So quant funds are driving basically 70% of all the trading action today are quant funds. It's hard to believe it, but that's what's really driving. Some are using mathematical models of cash flow and revenue. Others are using sentiment factors, industry factors, et cetera. So when we look at PMI, and I mentioned in my opening speech yesterday, it is forward looking. GDP is like driving your car and looking in the rear view mirror. You can't stare in the rear view mirror going 60 miles an hour. You will have a crash. So you have to have what's PMI, which is the Purchasing Manufacturers Index, it's forward looking and it recalibrates every month. So what do we do? We went back and took a look at a trend and we said, well, look at what's taking place. And if I said this is a factor that could derail Trump being reelected, but fortunately the global PMIs have turned, but the US is still negative. So why is that? Well, if the one month is above the three months, then the probability of energy rising is 88% of the time and crude 63, and S&P metals and mining 63%, and copper 88% of the time. So I've gone back in data for 20 years, and in his, each, each month that the one month is above the three months, that probability rises. My confidence is greater. In basketball, it would mean that I'm a great three-point shooter. And what happens when the PMI, the global PMI is negative? When the one month is below the three months, then all of a sudden S&P energy stocks fall 89% of the time. S&P metals and mining stocks fall 89% of the time. And copper falls 78% of the time. So you can apply probability analysis and do statistical analysis. And what happens is that every time PMI comes out, the pipes between the, the resource uh, hedge funds, that is the pipe between New York and Chicago pits for copper, oil, and gas, heat up. And there's rapid trading each time this data comes out. So another way of looking, at it, as I said, gold is both performed and it does it on a regular basis. And so now we're starting to see quant funds will drive into gold stocks. If the gold stock makes a 10-day high and, and bullion makes a 10-day high, then all of a sudden they will jump into that stock and keep it as long as the 10-day high maintains itself and the bullion. As soon as one of the two break, they're out. And they trade for five basis points a trade. So there's a high velocity of trading and there's not that much friction in the commissions. 
And so there's an inverse relationship between real and negative interest rates in gold, and this is all done with macro quant funds. And each stock, each asset class, like each of us have a different fingerprint, and each of us look different because we have a DNA that makes us different. Well, each stock has its own DNA of volatility, and each commodity has its own DNA of volatility. And this is looking at when you're rolling, you can look at stocks, you can look at commodities, you can look whatever you want. But what we're seeing now is Ray Dalio is very big in applying quant dynamics and then having a very strong Socratic discussion over them. And Sam Zell, he's a, a gut investor. And, and uh, Paul Tudor Jones is a commodity expert. And he's deployed a lot of money in the past couple of years into the quant world. So now that is a reason why when I take a look at royalty companies, who dominates royalty companies? The three big amigos are worth $40 billion in market cap. And they have profit margins, gross profit margins of 50%, and the average gold stock is 20%. So profit margin is an important factor for picking stocks. Royalty companies have a superior business model, so what happens is that you see non-gold funds buying the royalty companies. And their valuations, they say, oh, they're too high, but no, they actually have more stable volatility of their revenue and cash flow than picking the underlying mining stock. And here are the royalty names as they're crushing the GDXJ in performance. And I used to hear all the time, when well, a big uptick in gold, these royalty companies will not perform. Just not true. They have far outperformed. And another thing that's important when you do the bottom-up stock picking is the revenue per employee. Goldman Sachs has the highest revenue of the investment bankers, a little like a million dollars employee. And royalty companies, you can see, are 16, 20 million, 19 million dollars of revenue per employee. And when you compare the mining companies where they get the royalties on, our dimension is much smaller. And royalty companies have no debt or little to none, and they immediately pay off their debt, whereas mining companies have much more debt. So quant funds love the royalty model. And royalty companies also have a dividend policy, so that as the gold price or silver price trades higher, that each quarter, and they simply pay a higher dividend. So you can see that it's a remarkable par model, and Pierre Lasson recently said in a webcast we did, that he could take the whole team and go to Hawaii for 30 years, and the dividend will still grow. I mean, just think of, that's an incredible moat. And Franco Nevada has outperformed Berkshire Hathaway, Berkshire Hathaway in the first 20 years of its existence. Then it merged with Newman, spun out in 2008. And since then, it's far outperformed Berkshire Hathaway. Why? Because it has an incredible moat around it. So now I went to turn around and say, how do I create an ETF that's intelligent? So I made 30% of it royalty companies. And then I turned around and started picking stocks on who who has the best revenue per share growth? Who has the highest cash flow return invested capital? And each quarter, I would just glean, i get rid of anyone that had that made stupid acquisitions, raised capital, it was dilutive on the key factors per share, and guess what happened? Far outperformed, just far outperformed. And it outperformed the GDXJ on a rolling 12-month period 92% of the time. Now, those who play sports know statistically that's very compelling. And that's what the quant funds do. And what I found in the mutual fund world or the ETF world, you have to have 21 names. You have, you're just the minimum, that's the minimum. Well, if you actually high grade that you only have 10 stocks that you buy that have the highest cash flow return on invested capital, and each quarter you kick out those that are not then the highest return on invested capital, you will far outperform even this GDX uh, J by a wide margin, and you'll be able to perform go AU. So the hedge fund world will plow into those stocks that have the highest profit margin. Their revenue last quarter is above the four quarters. Their cash flow last quarter is above the four quarters. And they have the lowest EBITDA on a relative basis, a, a, a EBITDA valuation model, a metric that a lot of them like to use. And they create a composite, and they will plow into those 10 names. And historically, 10-day high in gold, 10-day high in Franco, Nevada, you see the volume surge. So this is giving you the data of looking at GoAU, how it's outperformed the GDXJ. And since I launched the ETF, I did all this back testing, and then I finally launched it, and it's outperformed it in two years by, as you can see here, 20%. And what's remarkable is that it outperforms in the down periods and the up periods. 
and the royalty companies, they actually fall less on the downstrokes and the corrections of gold, and they rise in tandem with the gold. So, and now you're seeing in the past couple of years, because I showed yesterday that uh, five years ago, uh, there was a big debate in Rob McEwen and why all the newsletter writers hate royalty companies. And I was going with my thesis that it's just a superior better business model. It's like your mother's best recipe for chocolate cake. You know, it's the best. It's just the best. And that's the reality of it. And it just shows up in the math. Oh no, it's terrible. So that's why I showed yesterday that Franco Nevada was my first pick, and uh, in, in that five-year period, it's up 280%, and the GDXJ is down. And the Vancouver index is down 36%. So that business model and the best stocks, is the junior stocks you want to buy, are those that have a royalty on them. And before it was negative. No, it's because they've done the valuation. They are not going to invest in that junior mining company to lose money. And they have metallurgists, engineers, geologists. They kick the tires. They do models and models and models, much greater than any fund manager ever does before they take the risk of deploying that capital. And so what you found is that some of the best performing gold stocks in the past five years, if you looked at a basket of names, they have a Franco Nevada royalty on them or they have a Wheaton uh, River royalty on them, or Precious now, change the name to Wheaton Precious. So using, when you see a junior all of a sudden establish a royalty with a Franco Nevada, it's not negative, it's just data. And you look at those companies, they far outperform. And in fact, they also get more trading volume into their stock as a good housekeeping seal. And some of that stuff comes from the quant funds. Now it was about three years ago, uh, Grand Columbia had stubbed its toe. And they had a huge financial problem. Gold had fallen, uh, just a sort of a litany of woes. And they owed $45 million of debt. And they restructured, and all of a sudden, they started increasing their production, they had financial discipline, and today they have over $80 million of cash on their balance sheet. So you're talking about a $120 million swing. And there wasn't one gold analyst covering it, not one. And the stock went up over that time period 500%. Well, who bought it? Not one newsletter writer was recommending Grand Columbia, not one. Who bought it? How did the volume go for 1,000 shares to all of a sudden trading 200,000 shares a day? Quants, anyone doing that basic math of looking at the values per share were growing. And that's what's important for you when you look at these companies that are producers, and once they stub that toll of revenue over the last quarter or four quarters, they get hurt. And so the quant's so important, and I really appreciate the significance of it. And that's why I made my investment in Goldspot. Ticker is SPOT. Why? Because these young guys, they have eight PhDs and a slew of other geoscientists that are there, and then predominantly, in, and then one here in Vancouver, and dominant in Montreal, and that's become the quant capital of Canada. And in particular, when I want to do AI machine learning. And Goldspot has been helping other companies find gold. They have Yamana's made press releases, Grand Columbia's used the services, and there's many now, Valet is using them. And what do they do? As I mentioned yesterday, is you've got to think of, of an athlete, world-class athletes like Rod Carew. How many here remember, the old guys here remember Rod Carew? So Rod could see what was written on a baseball coming at him at 100 miles an hour because he was gifted like a singer with the DNA to slow down the ball. Wayne Gretzky slowed down the puck. Everyone else was scrambling. For him, it was all slow motion. And the same thing was with Magic Johnson and their ability. So they had phenomenal peripheral vision. This is how far I can see. Great world-class athletes have peripheral vision back here. So what does AI do when, when they use systems like Goldspot, who is the premier firm? Well, all of a sudden you make a geologist, a good geologist, into a Wayne Gretzky geologist. You make them into a Michael Jordan geologist because they're able to use these tools to enhance. And what do they do? They make less errors. They de-risk exploration. That's what they do. And in talking to them before I made my investment is they have to scrub the data. 
And I can relate to that as I began this presentation. They have to scrub the data because I had to scrub the data to pick the stocks. Can you imagine taking all that geological data and then all of a sudden you have to have tectonic PhDs and tectonic plate shifts overlooking at ge different geological uh, structures and uh, you can go on with all these different scientists. They, they have them. So that's why I made the investment. They do swaps and, to, and help some of these junior explorers. They get back a royalty in those assets. And uh, one day they're going to have one of these hits where there's a mega discovery and it's very, very exciting what they're doing. So the world of quant world, everyone is looking at, there's iPhone, iPhone is doing facial recognition. Uh, that's the same thing that they can go and take a look and recognize uh, samples of, of core. I can't tell the difference on the core. But basically with the AI that I'm looking here identifies and opens my phone, they could turn around and look at millions of pieces of core and all of a sudden do AI basic recognition like the phone, my face, they can identify great rock, rock structure. And so what do they do? They de-risk exploration. Thank you very much and good luck investing.